Now, we've got an interesting talk uh, today. The title alone creates a lot of interest. Nelson, an admiral led astray to victory. So I can't wait to see what this is all about. Uh, Walter uh, started out in the merchant, uh, then the New Zealand Navy, then the RAN, and he's had a lot of gunnery practice. This is not a guy that you would uh, mess with uh, at all. Horatio Nelson is perhaps history's ultimate tragic hero who died in victory 200 years ago. Few people have more books written about them, over a thousand to date. So what is there new to discuss? We have discovered a little known interlude in his life when he was actually on holiday in Wales where there were no newspapers and the Admiral with only one arm could barely write. And at this time he had no secretary. So with little record, is this period worthy of comment? And you can be the judge. And so here we go. Perched high above the rooftops on a magnificent column is an I iconic landmark where Lord Nelson surveys the capital of a great empire. His statue is guarded by four bronze lions with their attendant flock of pigeons representing the great victories of Cape St. Vincent, the Nile, Copenhagen and Trafalgar. On top of the column is an 18 foot Nelson statue, and it's something of a contradiction, as in real life he was a diminutive figure with only one arm, one eye, and not too many teeth. But he was a brilliant fighting admiral, a hero with an unorthodox private life, a true celebrity who commanded adoring crowds wherever he went. Our story starts and ends nearly prematurely in the West Indies, as it was amongst the slave traders, the sugar merchants, and the barbaric pirates of the Caribbean that Nelson learned his trade. After we have gained an insight into his early life, we moved to a further study towards the peak of it, his career when he embarked upon a grand tour across England and Wales. Britain were, uh, and Spain were rivals over access to the riches of the new world, but they largely maintained their own spheres of interest until Britain wrested control of Jamaica from Spain. Further concessions were gained when the British South Sea Company was awarded the Asento de Negros, a 30-year contract to supply slaves from the British Royal African Company to Spanish America. Slaves first landed at Jamaica and were transshipped, and Britain was allowed to establish limited trading houses at specified Spanish colonial ports. This opening was exploited by merchants involving contraband and piracy, which drove the parties apart. Nelson, like many other notable naval men, gained experience in this cradle of the Navy. Here they fought for control of empires, and eventually they fought against themselves in the American Revolutionary War. It was at Port Royal, Jamaica, not yet 21 years of age, that Horatio Nelson was elevated to post captain and to command of the frigate HMAS Hitchinbrook. Dreaming of glory, the useful Captain Nelson led the San Juan expedition, taking an armed force up the San Juan River and across the Isthmus of Nicaragua with the aim of cutting Spanish America in to two and giving Britain access to the Pacific Ocean. Olden charts ominously refer to this as the Mosquito Coast. So despite initial success, the invaders soon began to fall to malaria, dysentery and typhoid. 
Nelson was laid low by fever and he returned to Jamaica dangerously ill. He was nursed by Cuba Cornwallis, an ex-slave and mistress of a fellow captain, William Cornwallis. Cuba was a nurse with a great prep reputation who ran a hospital, an early Florence Nightingale. And I haven't got a picture of Cuba Cornwallis, but this is what Port Royal was supposed to be like about that time. This campaign was a total failure, resulting in the loss of two and a half thousand troops and a thousand sailors. Nelson returned to England and when medically recovered was lucky to receive another command, being dispatched to Canada and later cruising to the West Indies. With the end of the Revolutionary War, Nelson again returned home and stayed briefly in France to learn the language. He contemplated entering Parliament, but was unable to procure a seat. In 1784, Nelson in command of HMS Boreas, where his brother was the chaplain, once again set out for the West Indies. Here the cash-strapped young captain met the widowed Frances Nisbet with her in infant son. Frances was born to wealthy parents, owning plantations on the island of Nevis. An admiralty court had been established on Nevis to curb piracy, with Nelson becoming a troublesome litigant. Frances, an orphan, was brought up by her uncle, and the couple married on the understanding of a substantial dowry. After covering her late husband's debts, Frances had little money, and that received from her uncle was far less than expected. Unknown at this time, a womb infection made Frances infertile. Upon return from the West Indies through disagreement with his superiors, Nelson's career was in limbo, spending the next four years on half pay. This and the couple's inability to have children led to bitterness. Revolution first came with the American Sons of Liberty demanding political representation. Included in their number was another orphan of Nevis, Alexander Hamilton, who had been sent to New York for education and long before Broadway became famous in penning the first draft of the Constitution of the United States. In 1778, France declared war on Britain in support of the Americans. And the following year, Spain and the Netherlands also declared war on Britain, effectively turning a local rebellion into a global conflict. The loss of its American colonies was a severe blow to the British government, fearing the export of revolution. It was these revolutionary wars that saw Nelson record to act recall to active service, where he distinguished himself in the Mediterranean and became friendly with the British ambassador to the Kingdom of Na Naples, Sir William Hamilton. William Hamilton was the younger son of Lord Archibald and Lady Jane Hamilton, his mother the reputed mistress of Frederick, Prince of Wales. It was rumoured that William was an illegitimate son of the prince and hence a half-brother of the future King George III, with whom he was brought up. William married Kathleen, Catherine Barlow, who brought wealth through Welsh estates. William and Catherine were highly educated and artistically complemented one another. Throughout this happy union, Catherine had indefinitely in different health, and although benefiting from a Mediterranean climate, died early and childless in 1782. Now we meet the star of this show. Let us meet one of the most remarkable characters where three men are drawn together by her sheer magnetism. She is Emma Hart a beautiful young artistic model who falls under the protection 
of the Honorable Charles Greville, amusing himself in educating her. Emma then marries his much older widowed uncle, Sir William Hamilton, and ultimately becomes the mistress of his friend, Admiral Nelson. Not the sort of description often found in history books, the Honorable Charles provides an intimate account of Emma. She has a good constitution, yet is delicate, and I think her looks improved as well as her health. I must add that she is the only woman I ever slept with without ever having had any of my senses offended, and a cleaner, sweeter bedfellow does not exist. When Sir William visited England in 1791, King George III pressed him to remarry, giving tacit assent to the penniless model, Emma Hart, although because of her background, she could never be presented at court. Weary after his 1801 success over the Danes at Copenhagen, Nelson hauled down his flag and came ashore for some badly needed rest. Earlier in the year, a formal break had been made with his long-suffering wife, Frances, and his mistress, Emma, enriched their lives with the birth of a daughter, Horatia. Another daughter, Emma, born in 1803, died of smallpox. The Admiral endowed with honours looked forward to the peaceful pleasures of a country squire at Merton Place, his mansion close to Wimbledon. Here lived Lord Horatio Nelson, Lady Emma, Sir William Hamilton, the Tria Junta in Uno, or three united in one. In the spring of 1802, the aging Sir William was complaining of Merton's lifestyle. His young wife's raucous parties, the constant stream of visitors, and of course the expense. Sir William had for some time been impotent and his friend's attention in meeting his wife's needs was not unwelcome but Emma's extravagant lifestyle contributed to Sir William's estates being mortgaged. These estates were managed by his nephew, Charles Greville, a younger son of the Earl of Warwick. Greville as Sir William's heir was instrumental in the proposed development of their lands at Milford into a vision of greatness, a naval dockyard to rival Plymouth. The persona of Nelson to influence the project could be a powerful factor in government investment. While Nelson disliked Greville, he was persuaded to take a grand tour, which included Sir William's estates. In the summer months, it was usual for those with means to avoid big city odors and escape to the country. The journey was well planned around visits to various towns, staying at the best inns or as guests of some important person. There was usually a public reception at which, which Nelson made an inspirational speech. This was a journey undertaken at a time when the great man was really out of pain, held no command, and being parted from his wife and openly living with another woman was shunned at court. The lengthy journey would not have been comfortable as many roads were in poor condition. On a rain swept Wednesday, the 21st of July, 1802, two heavily laden carriages departed Merton bound across the English heartland to the west coast of Wales. They contained Sir William and Lady Hamilton Lord Nelson and his brother, the Reverend William Nelson, his wife, Sarah, and their son, Horatio, on holiday from Eton. Sir William's manservant, Fracantello, a maid, and Lord Nelson's valet, Gayantino, accompanied the party. 
Endless changes of clothes were needed as both Horatio and Emma were dedicated followers of fashion. Two coachmen were required for two pairs of four horses that were frequently changed. The first stop was Oxford, where Lord Nelson was granted freedom of the city of dreaming spires, and both he and his brother were awarded honorary doctorates by the famous university. They also called it the jail, providing gifts for the inmates. Staying at the Angel Inn, they were joined by the Admiral's favorite sister, Catherine, known as Kitty, and her husband, George Machen, and their son. A joyous occasion, as Kitty and Emma were friends. On Saturday, the 24th of July, they arrived unheralded at nearby Blenheim Palace. And although his standard was flying, the Duke of Marlborough was pointedly not at home. More likely, his grace felt unable to receive Lady Hamilton. At Gloucester, this is Gloucester Jail, the bells were rung to cheering clouds. The cathedral and other places of interest were visited, including the jail with gifts for inmates. The rough and tough who manned his ships were often impressed minor criminals. Perhaps he recalled the words of Dr. Johnson. Being in a ship is like being in a jail with the added chance of being drowned. A man in jail has more room, better food and commonly better company. With the weather much improved, the Machams left for their, their home in fashionable Bath. Coincidentally, Lady Frances Nelson also resided at Bath, where she was looking after Nelson's aging father. The remainder of the party continued to Ross on Wye, a beautiful part of the country, and upon arrival breakfasted at the Swan Inn. Being warm and sunny, they took a pleasure craft down the river, protected by an awning and tastefully garlanded with laurel leaves. In the late afternoon, reaching the ancient border town of Monmouth, they were escorted by the band of the Monmouth militia, playing See the Conquering Hero Comes. The Monmouth militia, which still survives, is the oldest serving reserve regiment in the land. After an overnight stay, they took the tortuous mountain road to Brecon to be warmly greeted by local hill farmers and were surprised by Welsh cottages with whitewashed walls, which stood out in the sunshine and churchyards full of cover, color given the custom of planting flowers upon the graves. When coking coal replaced charcoal as the flux for smelting iron ore, an abundance of both were found in the valleys of South Wales. This led to the rapid expansion of ironworks based on Merthyr Tydfil, where great Foundries worked day and night, releasing vast quantities of smoke from tall chimneys where the skies were darkened with soot and they produced a dismal atmosphere, which left a sour taste in the mouth. The Americans and no Napoleonic Wars proved a bonanza for the ironworks. In a few years, Merthyr had grown from a small village to the largest town in Wales, with a population in excess of 8,000. This led to overcrowded slums of immigrant workers. Life was grim in these early days of the Industrial Revolution, so the Nelson visit was welcome, bringing to the lives of these ordinary working folk a new sense of purpose. They were entertained by the self-made industrialist, Richard Crawshay, 
with the largest ironworks in the kingdom. Nelson wanted to see the mighty furnaces whence came iron that was milled into cannons and shot for the great ships and to thank the workers. The visit was marred when three men were injured and a young boy killed by a cannonball fired in celebration. Lady Hamilton was deeply distressed and insisted on seeing the child's parents and paying their funeral expenses. The journey continued across narrow winding mountain roads until they reached the county town of Carmarthen, staying at the Ivy Bush Hotel, where the mayor and corporation held a civic reception in their honor. That evening, the visitors were entertained at a variety show where the Admiral presented the conjurer with a guinea. The pace slackened when they reached Milford Haven in time for the celebration on the 1st of August, commemorating the fourth anniversary of Nelson's triumph at the Battle of the Nile. Charles Greville was responsible for building the new town of Milford in which Sir William had speculated his fortune. In promoting the new town, the, sur the tourists were entertained at the Lord Nelson Inn, which provided accommodation for passengers using the Irish packet. Sir William presented a fine portrait um, of his lordship painted by Leonardo Gazzardi. The Admiral spoke with enthusiasm at the potential of this site as a future major dockyard, extolling its virtues as one of the finest harbors in the world. Shipbuilding had been known here for many years. With the first naval vessel, the 28 gun frigate HMS Milford laid down in 1757. In the same year, the Admiralty conducted a survey of the Haven and recommended construction of a naval dockyard, giving impetus to Sir William and his nephew building a shipyard, which they leased to Harry and Joseph Jacob. In 1796, the Admiralty contracted the Jacobs to build a frigate. When the Jacobs became insolvent, solvent, the Admiralty accepted the lease and they built seven ships. Charles Greville was also busy persuading leading American Quaker families, including the Ross, the Floggers, and the Starbucks, to move from Nantucket to Milford. These important families from the center of the American whaling industry relocated to avoid punitive taxes placed on important American goods following the War of Independence. Despite Nelson's fulsome praise, negotiations between the Hamilton Estates and the Admiralty dragged on for a number of years. Failing to agree, the Admiralty walked away and established a rival facility on the opposite shore of the Haven. The new Royal Dockyard at Pembroke launched its first ship in 1816 and continued production until closure in 1926. From Milford, the party proceeded to Stackpole Court, where Lord Nelson spoke with Lord Cawdor about the last attempted invasion of Britain, which had occurred only five years earlier. In February 1797, while revolution raged across the Channel, four French ships headed for Wales under the command of Colonel William Tate with 1,400 troops seeking to inflame revolution amongst the Welsh. Colonel Tate, a 44-year-old Irish-American, could not speak French, and half his troops came from French prisons. As soon as they landed, most deserted in search of alcohol, loot, and women. Now more evenly matched, the remainder were repulsed by the local militia of 600 men under Lord Cord Cordor, 
supported by 150 sailors with nine cannons taken from their ships. The Pembrokeshire Yeomanry proudly wear the Battle Honour Fish Guard, the only British regiment awarded a battle honour for conflict on home soil. After a skirmish, surrender terms were negotiated and the French troops temporarily held prisoner with Colonel Tate and his officers guests at Carmarthen's Ivy Bush Hotel, where the Nelson party had recently resided. They were soon released under a prisoner exchange program. Two of the invaders' ships were captured and recommissioned into the Royal Navy, one becoming HMS Fishguard. This is a uh, picture of uh, Welsh ladies in their red cloaks and uh, large black hats. And in the, they came to watch the battle and in the distance, they were confused with British guards, which uh, upset the French tremendously. And they thought they were being surrounded and uh, they gave up without much of a fight. At Tenby, which is a pretty little town, ships of the King's Navy were anchored offshore. And dressed overall, they fired a deafening salute as Nelson entered the historic wall town. Tenby, a fashionable seaside resort with its houses painted of many colors, was offering the newfound attraction of sea bathing. They stayed at East Rock House, the home of Charles Greville, and a grand ball was given in their honor. The next call was at the bustling seaport of Swansea with a population of 7,000, the Principality's second town, where nine copper works in the Swansea Valley, Valley accounted for most of Britain's out, output of this prize metal. Copper sheathing was introduced in the Royal Navy in 1761 as a prevention against worms that ate the hulls in tropical waters. The added benefit was of increased speed and greater time spent at sea, which justified the additional cost. Copper was supplied from mines in North Wales. As it took three tons of coal to smelt one ton of copper, it was economical to bring copper to the coal, and so Swansea grew. HMS Victory was coppered during her 1780 refit by when the hulls of most Royal Naval ships had been sheathed. That's uh, a copper mine. Nelson visits Swansea on the 13th of August 1802 and the following day attended a banquet in his honour. A number of sailors on leave drew the Admiral's carriage through the streets, much to everyone's delight. In return, Nelson made a patriotic speech and personally thanked the copper workers. The party stayed at the Mackworth Arms, where the landlord presented his son. He so impressed the Admiral that he provided a reference which gained the young man a place at the Portsmouth Naval Academy. Three years later, Lewis Rotley, as a Marine officer on board HMS Victory, witnessed the fatal shot that killed the great man. A distraction for the ladies was a visit to the Swansea Pottery, which specialized in commemorative wear. The pottery did well after Trafalgar in producing drinking mugs, mugs which became popular with the masses. The return journey started taking the easier coastal route following the old Roman sea road extending from Gloucester to Carmarthen. They stopped at Margam Park, home of the Talbot family, with an immense fortune made from coal and iron. Margam was famous for its glass orangery, where Spanish citrus trees were set amongst Italian statues which flourished during the winter months and were brought outside during the summer. They then continued crossing two rivers, firstly the Taff at Cardiff, the present day capital city of Wales, but then a small town of 2000 souls. 
Finally, they crossed the muddy banks of the Usk at Newport and made for the ancient border town of Chepstow, guarded by its vast Norman fortress. On 17th of August, refreshments, a refreshment stop was made at Piercefield Park on the outskirts of Chepstow, where they were entertained by Mr. and Mrs. Nathaniel Wells. The park, magnificently situated overlooking the shimmering waters of the Severn Estuary, was an early example of landscape architecture, attracting visitors from far and wide. Of further interest was the exotic owner, Nathaniel Wells from the island of St. Kitts, only two miles from Nevis, the home of Lady Frances Nelson. William Wells from a Welsh family was a successful slave trader on St. Kitts. After his wife died, he fathered children by female slaves. Although not uncommon, Wells differed by looking after the mothers and children. When he died, he left his estate to his dark skinned son, Nathaniel, who had been educated and lived in England. In 1801, Nathaniel married the beautiful Harriet S., the only daughter of the Reverend Charles S. Regrettably, there's no known portrait of Mr. Wells, but the landscape painter Joseph Farrington, who dined at the house, described his host thus. Mr. Wells is a West Indian of large fortune, a man of gentlemanly manners, but so much a man of color as to be little removed from a Negro. He continues, Miss Wells is as fair as a mother, but the eldest son dark like the father. However, nothing stopped the progress of this affable gentleman into society. As a church warden, a magistrate, commissioned into the local militia and receiving royal patronage as high sheriff and Deputy Lord Lieutenant of Monmouthshire. Written in 1760, the official march of the Royal Navy, and until recently the Royal Australian Navy, is Heart of Oak, containing the lyric, Heart of Oak are our ships, Heart of Oak are our men, telling the qualities and virtue of Oak were central to the values of both Royal Naval ships and its men. But all was not well with the supply chain, and the first rate ships such as Victory could not complete their refits for lack of timber, leading the Admiralty to seek alternative supplies from as far afield as New South Wales. In 1778, Admiral Augustus Keppel, flying his flag in HMS Victory, found his fleet so reduced by lack of adequate maintenance that he returned to Portsmouth rather than giving battle to a similar sized French fleet. Economic measures implemented by the first Sea Lord Admiral St. St. Vincent and strict Admiralty inspection procedures resulted in near exhaustion exhaustion of stocks. A cartel of, of timber merchants led by D John Boucher of Chepstow wrote to the Admiralty seeking improved terms. The merchants would rather sell into another market at lower prices than have every piece of timber cut and bored by the dockyards in search of defects and often rejected. At Chepstow, the party heralded by a cheering crowd, stayed at the Three Cranes Inn. Here John Boucher met Nelson. The conversation between the Admiral and the merchant would have been interesting, and there must have been a meaningful rapport. As less than a week later, a fleet of timber trows, those are sailing barges, sailed from Chepstow with cargoes of the best oak the forest of Dean could supply. 
This resulted in 781 loads of oak being sent to Plymouth and 490 loads to Portsmouth. The cargoes were gratefully received and payment promptly made. The impasse had been broken and the dockyards were once again back at work. The small market town of Monmouth was again aroused by the returning tourists. They were fated at a beauty spot high above the town. Mysteriously, the Kimin, many miles from the sea, has a naval temple devoted to British folk. Britain's finest admirals. The temple was dedicated by the Duchess of Beaufort, a daughter of Admiral Old Dreadnought Boscannon. Nelson was much impressed that such a tribute should be made by a small Welsh town, noting that this was then the only monument erected to the Royal Navy within the kingdom. It is noteworthy that Monmouth now houses a museum dedicated to Nelson. The evening entertainment was at the Beaufort Arms where they feasted on buck of venison supplied by his grace. The hero of Nile gave a patriotic speech and in festive mood, Emma led the singing of poplar airs. Continuing their homeward journey, the company made for Rudhill Manor at Ross on Wye, where they stayed as guests of Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Westfarling, friends from the Naples day. One evening, there was a grand ball complete with fireworks with hundreds of spectators enjoying several hogsheads of cider. That's a cider mill. While resting here, Nelson completed an 11 page draft report of his findings on the poor status of the forest. The document was written with his left hand and only contained one full stop, but there was a plentiful supply of commas. A grammatical copy was produced for the Admiralty by a secretary on return to Merton. The Admiral's report was well received and instrumental to improvements in forestry management regimes. They next made for the cathedral city of Hereford, known for cider and perry, of which supplies were purchased and loaded on the ever groaning carriages. Nelson was made a freeman of the city. The following day, they drew up at Worcester, where they were greeted by the peals of church bells and the roar of cannon. Accompanied by a musical band, they set off along the high street to Diglis and Chamberlain's China Works, where they toured the factory. Nelson, full of admiration, placed a large order for decorated breakfast, dinner and dessert services. In the painting room, they met the master craftsman, James, James Plant, who made the following observations. A battered looking gentleman made his appearance. He had lost an arm and an eye. Leaning on his left and only arm was the beautiful Lady Hamilton evidently pleased at the interest excited by her companion. And then amongst the general company came a very infirm old gentleman. This was Sir William Hamilton. At the important manufacturing center of Birmingham, they re resided at the Stars Hotel. Here they visited the great industrialist, Matthew Bolton later attending a theatre production of The Merry Wives of Windsor, where the crowd gathered and waited until midnight to see the great man, and with much cheering, pulled his carriage back to the hotel. Such was the impression that Nelson made that only four years after his death, by public subscription, Birmingham was the first place in the kingdom to erect, erect a statue in his memory. 
Matthew Bolton too must have been impressed as after the Battle of Trafalgar, a beautifully crafted victory medal was struck at his famous mint. 14,000 copies were made of these medals at Bolton's own expense and distributed to everyone who took part in the battle. I think that's the uh, statue of, of Nelson in Birmingham. And those are the coins that uh, Bolton had minted. A further call was made to Warwick Castle where Sir William's sister Elizabeth was Countess. The final stop was Althorpe, the ancestral home of the Spencers, who were amongst the most prominent of Whig grandees who saw themselves as the guardians of English liberty. Earl Spencer, a former First Lord of the Admiralty, had helped guide Nelson's career, but with one final setback, the haughty Lady Spencer, who shunned Nelson, was pointedly unavailable. They returned to Merton Place on Sunday, the 5th of September, 1802, after a journey of 45 days. Nelson's valet and promising accountant provided precise details of the cost of the grand tour at 481 pounds, three shillings and 10 pence, about a thousand Australian dollars at today's prices, with the cost shared equally between the Admiral and Sir William. The London newspaper, The Morning Post, noted it is a singular fact that more brilliance attends Lord Nelson in his provincial rambles than attends the King. Nelson had the distinction of becoming a national hero and as well as public adoration, he maintained the support of his naval colleagues. But at the higher strata of society, he was shunned as they could not condone open adultery. The tour, however, took its toll on the ailing Sir William, who died in April 1803. His body made another lonely journey to Pembrokeshire, buried next to his first wife, Catherine. The following month, war again broke out with France. The aging Nelson was once again called upon, this time as Commander-in-Chief of the Mediterranean Fleet, a position he held until his untimely death a little more than two years later. While we know much of the life of this brilliant fighting admiral, this story shows another important dimension to his complex character. Personal thanks to iron and copper workers, speaking to them in plain language they could understand, demonstrated compassion for the working man. Time is also taken to visit the unfortunate in jails. He again turns a blind eye to bureaucracy and seeks opportunities to resolve a dispute concerning the vital supply of timber that seriously impacted operational capabilities of the fleet. It is perhaps two women that have the greatest impact upon the life of Britain's most successful admiral. The first was a dark beauty from Jamaica who saved his life after the loss at the Battle of San Juan. The second was Emma, who in leading the admiral astray, possibly gave him his ultimate victory. And I've put this the final ramble on English soil. On Saturday, the 14th of September, 1805, Admiral Nelson walked from the George Hotel in Old Portsmouth to the Sally Port, where he was taken by cutter to HMS Victory, which weighed anchor the following morning for the subsequent Battle of Trafalgar. Nelson was accompanied on this pleasant walk and for dinner on board by George Canning, Secretary of the Naval, Navy, and George Rose, President of the Board of Trade. Governor Arthur Phillip named Rose Hill, the settlement we now call Parramatta, 
and Rose Bay, the largest bay in Sydney Harbour, after George Rose. Rose was also the first to hear from Captain Hardy when Victory returned to Portsmouth after the battle of Nelson's dying words. Tell Mr. Rose I have left Lady Hamilton and little Horatio to the nation. George Rose became Horatio's guardian. Over the years, I've retraced most of Nelson's footsteps during his grand tour and know most of these places, and for two years lived in Old Portsmouth. As a final surprise before leaving Portsmouth, Josie and I were invited to dine with the Commander-in-Chief Naval Home Command, Admiral Sir Desmond Cassidy and Lady Cassidy, on board his flagship HMS Victory. Having dinner in the great cabin used by Lord Nelson was indeed an honor. Showing how the tide has turned over the intervening years, the other guest at this small dinner party was the Chief of Staff of the French Navy, Admiral Ives Leanhart, accompanied by his staff commander. And that finishes our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Waldo. Uh, apologies for a slow start, but what an outstanding attention to detail and choice of words and fantastic photos. Waldo, you've missed your real vocation, storyteller extraordinaire, travel log, wonderful trip back in time to a previous age. Thank you. We're now open for questions. Um, thank you very much for a, a lovely presentation. Sir William Hamilton, during his many years at Naples, really was the premier archaeologist of his day. And he was finding uh, Roman statuary and pots all over the area where he, uh, he lived, including on the sides of Mount Vesuvius. And uh, of course, these statues were causing a sensation because they revealed just how louche, uh, from the point of view of 18th century England, uh, the uh, lifestyle was of the Romans. In particular, um, there was evidence that uh, diaphanous gowns were worn by the women who were uh, depicted in these statues. Now, Emma picked up on this and used to have what she called a party after dinner with her attitudes. And what she did was to get the, th the thinnest, most diaphanous muslin available, saturated in water. It's a warm climate, remember. And then she would strike poses like those of the statues that Sir William was digging up. Not surprisingly, Nelson and his band of brothers used to come ashore to Sir William's residence and not only enjoyed uh, the, uh, the excellent food that Sir William provided, but also uh, the uh, attraction of Emma herself uh, posing in her diaphanous uh, white muslin, uh, striking her Grecian and Roman attitudes. Uh, not surprisingly, Nelson was smitten. George Rose, uh, he got the message uh, from Nelson, uh, from Hardy, about Nelson leaving uh, Lady Hamilton to the nation. But unfortunately, uh, uh, the attitude to uh, Nelson's relationship with Lady Hamilton, uh, the Parliament didn't do anything about it. George Rose did, in fact, campaign for her for quite some time. He uh, became Horatio's guardian, uh, but eventually even uh, he got a bit fed up with uh, Emma mm -hmm. and all her ass assistance. And uh, I don't know whether anybody knows, uh, her fate was to be buried as a pauper That's in right. Calais. Where she had fled to avoid her creditors because um, she had got to the point where she was vastly overdrawn uh, in every sense and needed to leave the country or she'd have ended up in a debtor's prison. Horatia, her daughter, who... Uh, denied all her life that her father was Nelson, though it was obvious to all he was, uh, married a clergyman, settled down, and lived an extremely pious and genteel life, uh, thereby attempting to make up for her mother's rather uh, uh, riffraff lifestyle uh, that 
she'd known when she was a child after Nelson's death. Walter, it's interesting to speculate on what would have happened had Nelson achieved his victory at Trafalgar but not been killed. He would have come back and, of course, would have received a hero's welcome. The nation was relieved of the threat of invasion. He would have been every bit the hero that he had been after both uh, the Nile and Copenhagen. But there are a couple of things to consider. One is that he was losing the sight of his good eye, so he would have been blind in the not very distant future. And the other thing, of course, is that he was still saddled with Emma, and gradually she would have made it impossible for him to continue living with her uh, because of her alcoholism and her spendthrift habits. Uh, I think it's fair to say that though we all mourn the loss of the great admiral in battle, uh, he himself knew that the time had come and his last words, thank God I have done my duty, were not only something he wanted the world to remember him by, but also in a sense, a realization that the temptations of leaving the Navy and not pursuing his career to its fatal end were very great. And Emma, of course, represented that term. And had he survived and been saddled with her, I think it's fair to say he would not be on a column looking down on us from Trafalgar Square. Yes, one wonders whether, in fact, his uh, insistence in going on deck with all his medals and everything was, in fact, a, a maybe a suicide mission. I think that's going too far. Um, he, he dressed in his full dress uniform because for the same reason that he was pacing the deck next to Hardy. Um, you can't expect men to be exposed to the fire coming down on them from uh, Red Table and the other ships that they were fighting uh, without their captain amongst them. Um, what kind of a man would he have been if he'd disguised himself as someone other than he was or taken refuge in his great cabin? Uh, so I don't think that one can attribute a suicidal intent to him, but he was very well aware of the uh, probability of his not surviving. We know that from the prayer he wrote in his cabin with every expectation it would be found after his death. Yeah. It's, it's a marvellous museum, that uh, museum at, uh, at Monmouth, which lots of people don't know it's there. And right next door that I, I discovered bit by accident was that uh, uh, militia museum of the, uh, of the I think it might be called the Monmouthshire Regiment. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's, that's a marvellous feature because they're the oldest regiment in Britain, um, which, again, I didn't know. Ah, look, I think we uh, might call it a, a, an end there. What a what a fabulous uh, trip back in history. Uh, you almost felt you were there at times. Uh, so uh, thank you, Ollie. You've really set a bit of a gold standard here for uh, people to follow. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for uh, attending. Uh, sorry about the, the uh, slow start, but uh, the technology sometimes just doesn't do uh, what you hope it, uh, what it needs to do. Thank you.